So for example, suppose I find examining my mind that I have a tendency to ill will or to, to resentment, or what do I have here? To ill will, to anger, to malice, those types of unwholesome mental states, defilements that are connected with hatred. So then the way to overcome this would be to develop the meditation on loving kindness, metta bhavana. And so if I practice the meditation on loving kindness, I set in motion certain potentials in the mind which are opposed to ill will, to hatred. And as those potentials are actualized and become stronger, then I'm able to eliminate, at least temporarily, eliminate ill will and hatred so it doesn't arise very often. If it arises, it doesn't persist a long time. If I have a tendency to envy, then I might practice instead the meditation of mudita, that's rejoicing in the success and good fortune of others. So when I rejoice in the good fortune of others, then this helps to overcome envy. And as I become more, <coughs> the mind becomes more familiar with the meditation on mudita, altruistic joy, then envy gets worn away until it becomes very weak, almost non-existent. If I have the tendency to conceit and arrogance, then I might do the contemplation of impermanence, like a kind of reflective contemplation that this body, this life, my wealth, my position, all of this must pass away. So how can I be proud of it? How can I base my conceit upon it? How can I look down at others when the turn in the wheel of fortune and they might be wealthier than I am, they might be more uh, higher status than I have. Okay, so this reflection on impermanence becomes the antidote to conceit, arrogance, and vanity. So these are methods of factor substitution. One develops one factor that's specifically opposed to a particular defilement, and in this way one weakens the defilement. Okay, so this, that's an important part of the Buddhist training, and generally this is, covers a good part of the preparatory ground in Buddhist mind training. We have to find out what our particular weak spots are, our vulnerabilities, what are the defilements that arise persistently in our minds, then we have to use the appropriate methods to counteract those defilements, to weaken them, to overcome them. Beyond this, there is another type of abandoning. This is called abandoning by suppression. And this doesn't mean the kind of anxious repression that we're supposed to have outgrown <laughs> in this um, enlightened modern society. <laughs> but rather this means the complete suppression of defilements through the ability to attain deep samadhi, particularly the stages of absorption the jhanas. So when one becomes skilled in samadhi, then one can enter into the jhanas, which are very pure, powerful, wholesome states of consciousness, where the mind becomes suffused with bliss and rapture and equanimity and tranquility, bright and radiant. And so one doesn't see any trace of these defilements in such a mind. And when one comes out of the samadhi and goes about one's day-to-day -day activities, the power of that samadhi still continues on 
so that the defilements don't even appear <coughs> in the form of occasional thoughts. And so in this way we say the defilements have been abandoned, excuse me, <coughs> the defilements have been abandoned by suppression because of one's ability to focus the mind on one object, to enter into this deep samadhi, tranquility of mind, the defilements don't appear. But even though the defilements don't appear, don't arise, the tendencies are still present within the mind. And if we don't go further in the training, those defilements can find the opportunity to arise. And if they do, then they will come to the surface and they can overpower the mind and pull one back down again. <clears throat> to illustrate the way this power of samadhi can suppress the defilements, without eradicating them. The texts tell a story, this comes in Visuddhi Magga. <clears throat> there was one elder monk who had a pupil named Dhammadina. The elder monk thought that he was an arhant, that he was completely enlightened and liberated, that he had eradicated all the defilements, but he was only skilled, he had mastered the samadhis, and he had the supernormal powers too. And because of that, he thought he was an arahant. Now his pupil, Dhammadina, was a real arahant. And Dhammadina had left his teacher to go off to meditate in seclusion. And one day, the thought came to Dhammadina, I wonder, what my teacher's real status is. And so using his ability to read the minds of others, he directed his mind to his teacher's mind and looked into his teacher's mind and he saw first the surface of a mind bright and radiant, but then using his power of supernormal power, he looked deeper into his teacher's mind and he saw that the defilements are still there. He's not yet liberated, but he's deceived himself into thinking he's liberated. And so one day he went to visit his teacher, he paid respects to him, then he said to his teacher, so you've attained the goal, have you? The teacher said, so it is, friend. <laughs> then Dhammadina said to his teacher, and do you have the supernormal powers too? The teacher said, I do. Dhammadina said, in that case, create an elephant. Okay, so the teacher said, not difficult. He used his psychic power, snap of a finger, and there was a big elephant standing about 30 yards from both of them. Then Dhammadina said, make that elephant go into rut. That's the state where the elephant becomes, it's like going into heat. So the elephant becomes excited and it's a kind of liquid comes flowing out the ears or the mouth, I'm not sure. Then Dhammadina said, make that elephant come charging directly at us. So then the teacher said, not difficult. With resolution of the will, the elephant turned to them, started running directly at them. The elephant got closer, closer, closer. Suddenly the teacher's face turned white. He turned around to start to run away. Then Dhammadina grabbed him by the robe and said, Tell me, teacher, if you're an arhat, do you still have fear? And immediately the teacher realized, I've been deceiving myself all this time. And then he said to Dhammadina, Please help me, give me some instruction. Because he knew when Dhammadina said that, he knew that Dhammadina had reached the goal. So then Dhammadina explained 
approach to insight meditation, the teacher went off to practice, and then the next day came back as a real arhat. <laughs> Everything has a happy ending. <laughs> Okay, so the defilements could still be there, but beneath the surface of this powerful mind of samadhi. And so to eliminate them, one has to develop insight or wisdom. This is panya, or vipassana knowledge. And that brings about the eradication, abandoning by eradication of the defilements. Through this third stage, the defilements are eradicated right at the root so that they can never arise again. Okay, and so, When the text says here, very concisely, knowing that covetousness and unrighteous greed is an imperfection that defiles the mind, the monk abandons it, and so on with all the other defilements, we have to understand that all three of these types of abandonment are compressed within this very short passage, but especially it's intended to culminate in abandoning by eradication. Okay, now the eradication of the defilements comes about when wisdom or insight is developed to a particular level, a level which is called the world transcending paths. These are the states of consciousness which arise through the development of insight. They're states of consciousness which have the power to eradicate the defilements right at the level of the root. Well, the word eradicate actually suggests root. So they have the power to eradicate the defilements so that they can never arise again. Then the commentaries explain which paths eradicate which defilements. There are four stages of enlightenment, or four stages of realization. <clears throat> Actually, I went through them last week when we did the sutta on number six, if one should wish, so I don't have to repeat them. Okay, so the path of stream entry, this is the first breakthrough to enlightenment, according to the Machi Mani commentary, eradicates contempt, insolence, envy, miserliness, deceit, and craftiness. I say that according to the Machi Mani, Machi Mani Kaya commentary, because I have not seen a sutta which states, I have not seen any sutta in which that is stated. And personally, I'm somewhat doubtful about this. And actually, I had this doubt many years ago, even when I was living in Sri Lanka. And I thought I was being a little bit, well, more than a little bit heretical in having that opinion. But then I read, I believe it was, it was something by Upandita Soyato. I believe it could have been the book called In This Very Life. And Upandita Soyato, who's a very conservative, traditional Burmese meditation master, also expressed exactly the same doubt on this point. So I felt that I was not completely <laughs> alone. <laughs> so sometimes the things in the commentaries don't always have to be taken to be incontrovertible truth. 
And so since I never saw this in the suttas itself, suttas themselves, I'm still willing to uphold doubts about them. Okay, then it says, okay, the stage of once returner, the second stage of enlightenment, is not said to eradicate any of the 16 defilements. Then it's said that the third stage of enlightenment eliminates four of these defilements. Ill will, anger, hostility, uh, and heedlessness. That's what's said in the, in the commentary. Now, based on the suttas, I would agree, ill will, anger, hostility is eliminated by the non-returner. And I would also put, to me it seems likely that the defilements under number one, contempt, insolence, envy, miserliness, deceit and craftiness, are also eliminated by the non-returner. But I have doubt that heedlessness is eliminated by the non-returner. I suspect that heedlessness is a general term, can continue on even up to the stage of arhatship. The reason I think the text put, puts heedlessness under number two here is because the commentary defines heedlessness as letting the mind roam among the five objects of sensual pleasure. And sensual craving is eliminated by the non-returner. But it seems to me that maybe this definition of heedlessness, as I said earlier, it's too narrow. If we give it a broader scope to mean any kind of negligence in training of the mind, then it seems that heedlessness is really eradicated only by the path of arhatship. Okay, then the path of arhatship will eliminate all the defilements that are not eradicated by the earlier stages. So the text here gives, or the commentary gives, abhijja visamalola, that's covetousness and unrighteous greed, obstinacy, rivalry, conceit, arrogance, and vanity. And I would also put heedlessness in its broader meaning there. Okay, this is as far as I managed to get today. If there's any questions, then please feel welcome to, to ask. Okay, please. Take, first take the floating microphone. to arrogance and vanity, some kind of obstinacy, some kind of greed. 
So that kind of heedlessness will remain. So it's, it's continuous, it starts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it doesn't end until one really has the... Yeah, yeah, that's the way I would see it. Okay, your second question. Inspired, uplifted, inspired, yes. uh, yes. joyful. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And is is that a, a rightful effort, or is that unskillful as? Oh no, no, not unskillful at all. Those are skill, skillful qualities, or wholesome qualities. So those are the things that sort of motivate you to continue along the way of the wholesome. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes people think that. <laughs> At least this was a sort of Western caricature of Buddhism back in the early 20th century. That that means that one has to dry up all vitality and become <laughs> like a vegetable. <laughs> like my mother used to say, when you become a monk, you become a vegetable. <laughs> eating <laughs> In that sense, maybe the vegetable becomes the monk, not the monk becomes the vegetable. Because if we take Visama to be synonymous with Abhicca, then uh, it has to be abandoned by the stream enterer. But Loba is always synonymous with Raga, so um, and only an Arya abandoned Raga. Uh, so what does the meaning of Abhicca, Visama, Loba, is there to mm. <clears throat> I don't really have like one single definite interpretation of it. You see that there are three interpretations here. So it's, a, it's an open field. <laughs> so when the ancient commentators had disagreements about it. <laughs> I'm not going to resolve the differences between <laughs> So just find whatever explanation is most meaningful and convincing to yourself.
called the Taste of the Spiritual Life. It's, it's not a pure meditation retreat, but there'll be periods of meditation, study, um, explanation of routine of monastic life, basic principles of Buddhist etiquette. I'm supposed to give some lectures each, each day. Um, so you're welcome to register for that. But the next Machima Nikaya class will be two Saturdays from now, that is December 5th. And then I'll finish this suit with December 5th. Okay, so let us end by sharing the merits with the Devas, the Nagas, the Bhutas. Thank you.